everyone, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video is about how to find a goshawk nest. Now this helps a lot of different individuals, falconers of course, uh, but also wildlife biologists who are doing a biological survey and bird banders and people who are just trying to know where to find and see goshawks in the wild. It seems to be a daunting task. If you go throughout, at, first of all, goshawks, of course, are a circumpolar species. They live all over the northern hemisphere. But I'm talking about uh, goshawks in North America. If you get into wilderness areas, there's trees, there's mountains, there's canyons. Where do you look? The trees seem to go on forever. And it is an overwhelming thought if you've never searched for them before. Now, I'm going to be sharing today some advice that stems from looking for and finding goshawks in the intermountain western region of the United States. So Idaho, Montana, uh, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, and parts of Arizona and New Mexico. Now, first of all, I do have to say, goshawks are their own individuals, so they can nest wherever they want to. However, having seen enough nests, I've picked up on some things that seem to be a common thread if, to give you some sort of a starting point to have success in finding a goshawk nest, and I hope they'll serve you well. And again, these principles seem to apply very well in the Rocky Mountains and the American West, but uh, I, I don't know how well they apply in the eastern United States or not, but I would think that being the same species, many of these principles will still apply. Now, the first way that most people look for goshawk nests is with a call tape, and there can be a lot of success with that which uh, you can go online, you can find recordings of goshawks, both them screaming, doing that gah, 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 gah sound when they're angry, as well as the hunger cry, the <laughs> where the babies are wailing loudly, telling the parents where they're at. Both of those calls are fairly successful at eliciting a response from goshawks, but not always. There, it's not a foolproof method, and as I'm going to show you how close they sometimes nest to people and when they nest very close to people they will often be very quiet and learn hey if I don't make a sound or a response I can nest very close and take advantage of that human proximity but but not be noticed in any way so call tapes of course are good most goshawks want to nest near water in almost every instance within 50 yards of the nest I will find running water now usually they don't want a big high traffic nest they don't want they, they want a, a creek or smaller even a trickle many of the goshawk nests i have found are in water that is only there during the spring runoff and the first part of the summer that that is just a trickle there's no fish there's no people animals aren't really using it it's their private tiny little creek all sippers seem to like uh to like water nearby, but goshawks in particular, that is something to watch for. So if you're looking at a map where you're trying to read the land, look for water, little tiny creek. Now here is the biggie. <clears throat> goshawks will hunt a wide range of food, both birds and mammals, and in a, in a, in a dire circumstance, even reptiles. But um, we, if you read field guides and research this species, it goes on and on and on about, oh yes, these amazing bird hunters, and oh, all these things, all these, you know, anything from a sparrow to a grouse that they will hunt in the forest. There's truth to that. But here in the Western United States, they thrive hunting species of high elevation ground squirrels, such as the Uinta ground squirrel. I cannot stress how important this relationship is. And this will really help you if you understand this relationship. Now, these little ground squirrels, locals often call them pot guts. They have a stumpy little tail and they have a big fat tummy. They have a big fat tummy because they are grazers. Humans will come into play because they are grazers. Being uh, rodents, they're cyclical in nature, meaning some you'll have two or three boom years where there's th these guys are everywhere and then their populations go down and they're always still there. Just like you have with jackrabbits where you one, one year you can't throw a stone without scaring up 10 rabbits and then you got 10 years where you don't. So. That, that can impact your goshawk numbers as well. But these little ground squirrels, these Uinta ground squirrels and cousins of the, the of this other high elevation ground squirrel species out there, they um, are grazers. 
So they're wanting to eat grasses mostly. And there's not that much grass in fir and aspen forests. Fir trees, pine trees, aspen trees, they take over. Uh, fir and pine trees will drop a lot of pine needles and those that help prevents a lot of grasses from growing up because of the chemistry of those pine needles. It prevents that. So then we come along and we find these areas that are flatter and we make our picnic areas and our campgrounds. And we're in these nice areas that, it's two things we do. First of all, we are trampling. We're going off trail and we shouldn't. And that prevents shrubs and bushes to grow up in a lot of these areas and it promotes faster growing species like grasses. So just by virtue of the fact that we're rather destructive, uh, grasses often grow in picnic areas and in campgrounds. This attracts the ground squirrels. So even if there's ground squirrels all over, there's going to be a hyper dense population near where people are camping and picnicking. Now, the second thing we do is we're idiots and we feed the wildlife. Humans are always throwing out, here's some of my bread, here's a peanut, here, and we're feeding the ground squirrels and they get fat and their, their ability to produce milk for their offspring goes up because they're not eating low, dentrient, uh, sorry, nutrient low food like grass. If you eat a peanut, that contains far more caloric value and positive fats for a ground squirrel than grass does. So they're, oh, they're fat, they're happy, they're doing well and they're having litters that proliferate. So in addition to that, the areas that humans find um, welcoming and enticing to build a campground or a picnic area are also areas where the water slows down. So if you think if you have a mountainside and you have rivers going down, but when you're getting into this kind of elevation, then water is slower and you can have the trickles of streams that I mentioned earlier. That's something that a goshawk finds enticing too, even if the ground squirrels weren't there. But if you add those ground squirrels, you have a perfect combination. Now, just looking for picnic areas can, can that alone can be very, very helpful. Uh, one story that I wanna share, uh, in the High Uinta Mountains of Utah, we have campground hosts where they'll find people to uh, oversee and take money for these campgrounds. And I went to campground hosts to this one that I'd never been to and I said, hi, I'm looking for goshawks. And I told the man, I, and, I, and I said, hey, I'm looking for these hawks. And I looked over while I was talking to him. They had two garbage can lids piled up with peanuts and bird feeders. And the birds were coming to the bird feeders and the ground squirrels were crawling all over these huge mounds of peanuts. And one, I'm not lying or exaggerating, one of the ground squirrels was so fat that he couldn't move his back legs. He was just climbing all over him like a seal. Uh, so I'm telling him, yeah, I'm looking for this gray bird with a banded tail. And he's like, oh, and all of a sudden his wife from in the trailer heard me and goes, you're talking about the devil hawk. Oh, I've seen the devil hawk. It's got blood red eyes like the devil himself. It comes out here and kidnaps my squirrels and my birds and carries them off into the forest. And what he does with him there, I don't know. And the husband like looked at her and said, uh, probably eats them. And she's like, oh, and she went off all upset. And I thought, how interesting that they are helping this goshawk family. So I went up the canyon a little bit and within a few minutes found a goshawk nest just off of that. Now, it's important to remember, I'm not saying that there's just goshawks all over the place. It, I'm saying it, the conditions combine that in the American West, picnic areas and campgrounds and high elevations that are welcoming to ground squirrels are also, for the reasons I've listed, welcoming to goshawks. Now, this can be so extreme that there's a proliferation of food beyond what is needed for the young. There is a nest up one of a canyon near my house and knowing this principle, I, I had started to learn to look for the picnic areas and look for the ground squirrels. I went up to this picnic area by a lake, people were feeding ground squirrels and I'm just sitting there, oh, okay, watching people, watching squirrels and right in front of me, I saw a goshawk carrying a live ground squirrel fly right, you know, 20 feet in front of my face and I'm like, okay. And I looked and I saw the direction it went and I heard in the forest, <whistles> all the babies calling and I just walked. It was five feet in a tree, five feet from a road that was surrounded by cabins. 
I looked up in the nest, three babies, and they, they were cropped up. They were fat beyond recognition. And I could see in the nest a pile of dead ground squirrels. And on the ground directly beneath him, and also spilling over into the road, was dead ground squirrels. There was so much food because of the combination of people feeding them that they were the, the parents were just, okay, I gotta bring food, gotta bring food to my babies. The babies had more than they could eat. So again, it is very true to look for these ground squirrels and, and listen, watch, observe. Now, one of the problems that we have <clears throat> when you're getting into this is when you look at a mountainside or you look at a canyon, you just see a million trees. There's trees everywhere. And you're just like, where do I look? You need to learn to read the landscape. So when you see a slope, it seems to be covered with trees. And because you're only seeing the tops of the trees, they seem to be all even in height, but they are not. What happens is at the top of the slope, way up in the steep zone here, the trees are rather short. And it snows all winter. It snows up on the slope. It sn snows at the curve. It snows at the bottom. But in the springtime, the snow melts. The snow in the flats goes straight into the ground. The snow at the base of the hill goes into the ground. But the snow up top slides down, melts, and, and compacts down at the base of the hill, right where the curve starts to go up. Because it seeps in there and you have triple or quadruple the amount of water collecting there, the trees are much larger. If you understand that and start investigating these hillsides and these slopes, you will see this. This is what I call the goshawk zone. Now again, this is not always true, but it is consistently true enough to be worth giving it to you as advice. So look for this slope where these larger trees are. Now, this is true with pine trees and fir trees and aspen trees, all of which goshawks will use as a nest. In addition to that, we have what we call dendritic patterning in ridges. So if you have a ridge, um, let's say you look at a hillside from the side view and it's anywhere from this steep to this steep from a side view, then as you're going up the canyon, you see this hillside. In addition to that, that ridge line will have many canyons going up into it as well. And because of the angle of the slope, each of those will open up into a round area with the same principle, where a slope on all sides will uh, draw them in and have bigger trees and tiny little creeks and a great place to nest. So here's an illustration to try to demonstrate that. This would be from a top view. Again, it's very stylized, but you can see the ridge going down. And you can see there's those little round sections of, um, even though they're on a hill, they're somewhat flat compared to the surrounding ridge. These are a great place to look for goshawk nests. Now, <clears throat> when we get up in the sky, it's a little easier to see these principles. So here's an example. Uh, take a look at this picture. This is up the canyon near my house. After years of searching, I started to find out uh, the movements of the goshawk pair there. Now, take a look at these four red arrows. The pair, I've been following this nest for over 25 years, and they will from year to year move which nest they choose to use. But notice the, that consistently, you remember the illustration of the slope, take a look that each nest site they choose is in the same proximity. It's the same angle of slope with those same old growth trees. So watch for that. Now, had to throw in as well, as I kept wandering and hiking around here, take a look at this image. The blue arrow is a sharp-shinned hawk nest, and the yellow arrow is a cooper's hawk nest. Kind of interesting to know that these animals, and just across the canyon, there's a golden eagle nest. So sometimes birds of prey can nest very close to each other. Well, I hope that this video proves useful to you and gives you a few tips to get you started. Uh, just remember, call tapes work great. Look for water like a small creek. Uh, ground squirrels are key. It's not always true, but 99% of the time, if you find a good population of ground squirrels, you're gonna find yourself a goshawk. And always remember the slope. Don't just look at a giant forest. Remember the slope and angle and find those old growth trees at the base of the hill just as it starts to angle up. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you find it useful. And let me know in the comments other videos you would like me to make and subjects you'd like me to share. And as always, happy hawking. Thank you.